Good morning, and thank you for tuning in to listen to me practice. I'm Scott Albright in Siletz, Oregon, and today I'm going to be in the book of Nahum, of all things. I've been marching through the Old Testament, actually the whole Bible, and Nahum happens to be along the way there. It's um, 30. It is the 34th book out of 39 chapters in the Old Testament. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for Jesus through the whole Bible. I've long been fascinated with the Bible and wondering about its origin, why we use it, you know, you name it. And so I decided to go through every book looking for Jesus. And I'd like to keep this particular teaching to about 25 minutes. So um, let's pray first. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd use me uh, to speak your word, to declare what it is that you'd like us to know about this book, to let us see Jesus in this book, to encourage us, Lord, to change us, to use us, to put the seed into our hearts so that it grows and it produces fruit. That's what I pray. That's what I hope for. And I thank you for everybody who would be listening to me this morning in, in the name of Jesus. All right, so I have a, an outline format. Now, what I've been trying to do is find my style, so to speak. And I got this outline, pretty simple actually, from a fellow pastor named James French. So my tip of my hat to him um, in my Bible in my contacts, by the way, it, it lists him as JR, and there is not a JR, except in my real life, there is a JR. He's a good friend of mine, and he loves the Lord, and I've got him quoted in my Bible about faith, about trusting the Lord, and, and about faith, and that's what we need to do. Nahum is all about the kindness and the sternness of God. And that's what I want to, to read about, the kindness and the sternness of God. Nahum was a minor prophet. They call them minor prophets only because they are shorter than normal. Let's say Isaiah or Jeremiah, they are major prophets. They are quite lengthy. This book is only about three chapters long, which I'm grateful for. And... The first chapter is where we're going to stay. The, the second and the third chapter is pretty much a judgment against Nineveh. Now, you'll recall that a couple of chapters ago, we were looking at Jonah, and Jonah was called by God to go to Nineveh and preach. And he didn't want to because they were so nasty and so evil that he didn't want them to repent. He wanted them to be destroyed. But God says, I love those people, and I want you to go there and proclaim the good news. And so you all know the story of Jonah and the great fish. And the people of Nineveh heard the message that God was going to bring judgment upon them. <clears throat> and they repented. They actually did turn from their evil ways, and God spared the city. And Jonah, by the way, was not too happy about that. But God says, I love those people. And so Nineveh, in the back of my head, I thought, well, did Nineveh get destroyed? And in fact, it did. And this book of Nahum is basically a judgment to Nineveh. And the reason they were destroyed is because about a hundred years after the repentance, they fell back into their evil ways again. And Nahum was told primarily to encourage the people living in Judah which would be the southern kingdom, that this evil would be destroyed. And uh, so in about 612 B.C., Nahum pronounces this judgment, and 612 B.C., this town, this capital of the Assyrians was destroyed. Now, Nahum itself, the word means comfort, and it's kind of associated with Nehemiah, which means the Lord com comforts or the comfort of the Lord. And Nahum was a minor prophet, as I've, I've spoken before. 
and he came from Elkosh. He was an Elkoshite. That means that he could have been from around here. <laughs> it would have been fitting right in. Um, name from Elkosh. Well, we don't have an Elkosh. We do have an Elk City. And of course, people love to hunt elk in our area. So he is from Elkosh. Uh, this book was meant for the Judah height readers to comfort them, to bring courage to them. It was an oracle or a prophecy against Nineveh. Similarly to Isaiah did an oracle or a prophecy about the destruction of Damascus. And Damascus, of course, has not been destroyed as was prophesied about. And that's one of the things that we need to look for today is watch the ultimate end game of the destruction of Damascus, Syria. It will happen sometime. Um, Isaiah's vision concerned Judah and Jerusalem. By this time in Nahum, uh, the Assyrians had already invaded the north, and that was called Israel, and the capital of Samaria. And the southern kingdom was called Judah, and the capital was Jerusalem. So this was primarily uh, to comfort the Judahites. Now, the key verses in Nahum would be verses 6, verses 8, and the key verse, the, the whole verse, the main thing that we want to look at is 15. That's, the, that's where Jesus is. Uh, chapter 1, 15. So let's begin with Nahum. And by the way, again, by, by way of introduction, the Assyrians, the capital of Nineveh, they were evil people. They were tremendously horrible. Uh, when they would conquer, they would brutalize, they would murder, they would rape, they would, and be proud of it. And it, it does sound like today, actually. So in chapter 1, verse 1, this is an oracle concerning Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. This is the Lord's anger against Nineveh. It says in verse 2, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord takes vengeance and is filled with wrath. The Lord takes vengeance on his foes and maintains his wrath against his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. So let's stop right there. In Nahum chapter 1, verse 2, The Lord is jealous and avenging. And that has always concerned me. It's like we're not supposed to be jealous. But what does it say in Exodus 25, 20 verse 5? This is the second of the Ten Commandments where the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. <clears throat> of this word spoken in Exodus 25, he says, God says, you shall not bow down to them or worship them for I the Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. And again, kind of like jealousy, I've thought about this. I think that's not very nice of God to punish children for their father's sins. And so I started thinking about generations. And it would not be uncommon to think about let's say one person <clears throat> in the generational chain who was corrupt and evil and they had a child who probably would carry on the traits of the parent who would carry on the traits of the parent who would carry on the traits of the parent and and therefore so you have one generations two generations three four five and what does it say I punish the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and the fourth generation. And I, I've always wondered, how long is a generation? Because Jesus said, when you see, basically, Israel coming into its own, when we see Israel gathering as a nation unto itself, and of course that happened in 1948 in modern times, they were scattered for thousands of years. He says, this generation shall not pass away. And when I was growing up, I was told that a generation was about 40 years. And so 
1948, we were looking to 1988, thinking, oh, surely this is the end of time. <clears throat> and here we are in 2024. And I've since thought about that. If a generation is from a parent to a child, it could be a generation is just 20 years long. Some would say 70 years long. But if this generation will not pass away, it could be it could be 100 years from 1948 to 2048. I don't know. Nobody really knows. But a generation could be 20 years long. And if that's so, I've done the math and I won't bore you with it, but if that's so, from the beginning of biblical history, which is about 6,000 years, think about it, there would be 300 generations is all. That doesn't seem like very much, does it? So God says, I will punish the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. But I will show love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So if a generation is 20 years, a thousand generations would be 20,000 years, which is well beyond the biblical description of time. So anyway, there's my deal about generations. Okay, let's continue on. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power in verse 3. And, and back on the jealousy part, God is jealous for what belongs to him and worship and adoration belong to him only. When we take our focus off of him and get distracted by something else, that's when he's jealous. Worship and praise truly belong only to the Lord. So that's why he is jealous. He's jealous and he's avenging. And that should bring us comfort because we know that God will be avenging upon his enemies. As we continue the second part of verse 3, the Lord will not leave the guilty unpunished. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebukes the sea and dries it up. He makes all the rivers run dry. Bashan and Carmel wither and the blossoms of Lebanon fade. The mountains quake before him and the hills melt away. The earth trembles at his presence. The world and all who live in it. Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. So my third point of this section, Nahum, which ends in Nahum 1.6, my third point is his way. His way is in the whirlwind and the storm and clouds are the dust of his feet. Who can stand in the path of God? We recently just had a, an ice storm, a terrible ice storm, and we were without of power for our house personally almost four nights. And you see these terrible pictures of floods and hurricanes and tornadoes and no one can stand in front of these God-sent things. These things that are of nature, they are the hand of God. They're the, they are the finger of God. His way, God's way, is in the whirlwind and the storm. How do you think he punishes people? I don't know. But that's one way. And who can stand? In verse 6 it says, Who can withstand his indignation? Who can endure his fierce anger? His wrath is poured out like fire. The rocks are shattered before him. And that is verse 6 of Nahum 1. Moving on to uh, the next two verses, in verse 7, The Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. This is a key verse. But with an overwhelming flood, he will make an end of Nineveh. He will pursue his foes into darkness. So he will make an end to, to Nineveh, which here is a representative of evil. He will make an end to evil. We should take comfort in that. Though it looks like things are bad around us right now, God will take his vengeance and will have his way. He will make an end to, to Nineveh. Evil. We are to trust in God. Kind of like our coins in, in the United States still say that trust in God. I could take one out. I think I've got one that says trust in God. 
always turn to the Lord and trust Him. That's what J.R. Schiller said. Always trust. Turn to the Lord. Always turn to the Lord and trust in Him. My friend J.R. Schiller quoted that. Because God will pursue His foes into darkness. And of course, I just made mention of the storms that we went through and the darkness. And when it got dark, when the sun went down, it was dark. So God will pursue his foes into darkness. And, and speaking of coins, we watched a movie the other day of a fellow who was kind of down and out. He was an attorney and he, he obtained a $5,000 retainer from one of his clients, but he needed 10. So he went to a place and he bet, he bet it all. He bet $5,000 on one deck of cards, hoping that he could double it. And of course he lost it. And our salvation is not like that. It's not like a 50-50. It's not like a flip of a coin. You know, heads or tails, you lose. We can choose. We can choose blessing or curse. And I pray that we would choose. We would step into the blessing circle. Because we trust Him. Because the Lord is good. He is a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in Him. Okay, um, chapter 1, verse 9. Whatever they plot against the Lord, he will bring to an end. Trouble will not come a second time. They will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. They will be consumed like dry stubble. So I'm closer to 70 now than I am 60. And... I've been here in Oregon for 44 years now, gosh. But when I left Idaho, I left a fraternity. And unfortunately, that is the fraternity where recently four students were murdered. And they were close and involved <clears throat> with the fraternity that I, that I left. But on the front side of our fraternity, you could take a, a shortcut over a hill to the campus or else walk the long way around. And I often would take the shortcut through the woods. But I had a dream shortly after I left. I never have forgot this dream that I was taking the shortcut back to the campus and it was laden with broken glass and thorns. And it reminds me of this scripture. It says, um, they will be entangled among thorns and drunk from their wine. If someone has not repented, including my loving fraternity brothers, and I, I do believe that many of them have, but those who are stubbornly refuse the Lord will be consumed like dry stubble. And so I, I've not been able to ever shake that dream that I had. It says in verse 11, From you, O Nineveh, has one come forth who plots evil against the Lord and counsels wickedness. This is great danger. Don't do this. Don't plot evil against the Lord. And don't counsel wickedness. It's like, oh, nobody cares. Go ahead and do it. No, the Lord does care. This is what the Lord says. Although they have allies and are numerous, they will be cut off and pass away. Although I have afflicted you, O Judah, I will afflict you no more. Now I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. And this reminds me of shackles and things that are tied around her neck. Um, recently, I was able to help a neighbor, several people. I wasn't the only one. Uh, Jim Reed came over with a chainsaw and, and, and chopped down this tree, cut down this tree. But it was so thick with ivy. We would get the little pieces on the, on the ground. And, and I just pulled the ivy away, and the ivy was that thick. And that's what this reminds me of. It's like something of evil will choke us and will grow if, if we don't rip it away, if we don't declare the blood of Jesus over it, and it will choke us. But God says in 13, I will break their yoke from your neck and tear your shackles away. He gives us freedom. I love that. In verse 14, the Lord has given a command concerning you, Nineveh, you will have no descendants to bear your name. 
I will destroy the carved images and cast idols that are in the temple of your gods. I will prepare your grave, for you are vile. And here is the key, the key verse to, to Nahum, I believe, in chapter 1, verse 15. Look, there on the mountains, the feet of one who brings good news, who proclaims peace. Hmm, who would that be? Of course, that would be Jesus. Celebrate your festivals, O Judah, and fulfill your vows. No more will the wicked invade you. They will be completely destroyed. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. Um, Kelly and I have been working with Windsor Braves for a long time now, 26 years, and the post isn't quite that old, but I remember going up to Clackamas, Oregon to a worship conference. And in our mind, there is a quite well-known worship leader, and Kelly presented him a post, and he, he proclaimed this to us. He says, how lovely on the mountains are the feet of those who publish or proclaim good news that Jesus is the Lord, that he is the one who saves. So in wrapping up this message from Nahum, I'd like to wrap it up already. There are two or three main points that I'd like to, to say. The first is from verse 3, that the Lord is slow to anger and he is great in power. We need to remember that. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And in verse 7, the Lord is good, a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. Remember that. So there's two things to remember. The Lord is slow to anger. He's great in power. Number two, the Lord is good. He's a refuge in times of trouble. He cares for those who trust in him. And number three, of course, verse 15. Jesus is the one who on the mountains he brings good news. And of course, he has commissioned us to proclaim that good news. He, he can't do it all. He said, greater works will you do than I do. And if you think about it, it's because we are multiplied. Not only is it just Jesus doing the miracles, but he has not only just sent out 70 or 72 people, but he sent out you and me to do his work, to be his hands and to be his feet. How lovely on the mountains are the feet of them who bring good news. So what should we do after hearing a message like this? Be attentive to our feet. We recently have been putting on the armor of God, the full armor of God, and it starts with the belt of truth, with the, the, the breastplate of righteousness and the shoes shod with the gospel of, of peace. We need to prepare our feet with the gospel of peace to be prepared. After that, we have the helmet of salvation. I've turned my hat around so you can see my face. When I turn it like this, it's in the shadow. So I've turned my hat around <clears throat> today. Uh, then we, we put on the helmet of salvation. We put on the, the shield of faith and we take up the sword of the spirit. But in this particular case, we prepare our feet. Um, the worship leader that I talked about a little while ago, um, he's also famous for a slogan that I have embraced, and that is, put feet to your prayers. What do we do after hearing a message like that? We trust in Jesus, the one who brings good news. We take his commission to go to do in his name. We are prepared with the gospel, with the preparation of peace. And we don't just pray, we go. It's like, where do you want me to go? So put on the full armor and put feet to our prayers. And then to conclude this message this morning, I would like to go to Romans 11:22. Romans 11:22, and I've titled this message "The Kindness and the Sternness of God." And Romans 11:22 says, "Consider, therefore, the kindness and sternness of God, sternness to those who fell, but kindness to you, 
provided that you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. You don't want to mess with God. You don't want to trivialize him. His way is in the whirlwind. He has the power to, to not only take our lives, but then to cast us into hell. Why would we fear the devil when the devil has no such power? It is God Almighty. And it's not just a flip of the coin for us. We get to choose. Just like the, the Israeli people, when they were coming into the Promised Land, there were two mountains set up. One was a mountain of blessing and one was a mountain of cursing, of curses. And the blessings are for those who willingly give their lives and their hearts to the Lord. The curses are for those who turn their back upon God, who say, no way, and become evil. And God says, I will take vengeance there. Your job is to love everybody, to go forth with gospel feet, so to speak, and I'll take care of the enemies. I will take care of the long game. So we trust in the Lord. Okay, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time. I, I praise you for helping me through Nahum. We look forward to the book of Habakkuk next. And thank you for your word. Thank you for your counsel. And we pray that we would continue to, to be kind to each other, to, to be peaceful to each other, to take a stand against evil for sure, and be ready to defend against evil but basically to be kind and we ask this favor we ask this we ask that we would do this today in the name of jesus amen amen okay so there you go there is my recount of nahum again thanks to james french for helping me to kind of keep things simple and to kind of go through it and um there you go see you at church <laughs>